and we're recording. Uh, thank you for tuning in to another edition of Hagley History Hangout. My name is Ben Spohn. I am the Oral History Program Manager at the Hagley Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Today, I am interviewing Gray Song Yan, uh, assistant professor in interior design and interior architecture at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia about her recent book, Building Brands, Corporations and Modern Architecture. So uh, Grace, to get us started, um, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, drew you to this topic that you wanted to write a monograph about it? Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here today. Um, appreciate that. Um, so this this project did actually grow out of a dissertation, um, which I completed at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and initially, so I actually worked in branding as an architect, in architectural branding, um, at a, a large firm called Gensler that had a, a sort of self-contained sort of branding studio within its sort of larger um, company structure. And um, it really fascinated me. Um, it was a very unique experience as an, as an architectural designer, because usually you work for, and I had worked for kind of these big name architects before, and you usually kind of design in their um, vision. Um, like I worked for Renzo Piano, so it's like Renzo Piano's vision or I am Pay's his vision. Um, but with branding, you actually do, it's really the client's vision. Like it's sort of really inverted um, experience where you're um, using your design skills to, to really um, form an identity or expand that identity of a company into uh, three-dimensional form, space, and experience. So that's what drew me to, to study. And I thought, you know, you know, no one had really done um, a historical study of brand, architectural branding. Um, and I, you know, I knew I had a hunch that if I looked historically in the 20th century in modernism, that, um, that there was, you know, these really great examples of, of space um, identity, corporate identity that was sort of ex translated into architecture and space that I thought was a really fruitful um, way. And I did, I did a lot of business history um, coursework also, which really fascinated me because also business history is not, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, a different field than architectural history. And a lot of architectural history doesn't really go into business history too much. So I was also excited about that interdisciplinary connection. How do you think you, uh, do you think you approach this topic uh, differently since you are also an architect? Um, definitely, yeah, yeah. I know like when people say they're an architectural historian, I think mo more often than not, they, they don't have a design background where they're actually designing things. They're more, it's more of like an art history sort of background. But yeah, I, I kind of have that unique uh, perspective where I, where I was a designer and I, I guess still am, although, you know, now I'm academic, but um, yeah, that definitely helps because, you know, I've been in the room where there's clients and you're showing, you're presenting your design and, you know, getting the client feedback and, and kind of familiar with that kind of um, dynamic of designing something for a client and kind of having it change, you know, not necessarily in a, in a negative way and maybe even in a positive way, having that design sort of change and adapt to the client's needs. And I think it does, it tends to be like thinking about architecture more of a service industry rather than, um, you know, I guess like an artistic vision kind of, that kind of artist kind of view of, of architects. Yeah. That's interesting, the idea of architecture as a service industry, because something that you emphasize a lot in your book is the back and forth between the clients and architects. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that in terms of some of what you saw in the archives at Hagley. Yeah, yeah, with, um, so the Philadelphia Saving Fund Society, um, it's a great collection at Hagley. Um, I possibly could have written the whole book about that. <laughs> there was so much. And um, yeah, it was a fascinating exchange between the uh, 
client, which primarily was the uh, saving fund president, um, James Wilcox. Um, and then the architects were George Howe and William Lascaz. Um, and so if you think of the, you know, the you know, this was the oldest saving fund um, in America. Uh, you know, basically bankers, uh, these conserv more conservative client, but then they're hiring these architects who are doing like the most radical uh, progressive design for their corporate headquarters, modern design. Because, you know, still when you look at the Philadelphia skyline, the PSFS building um, is still sticks out as, a, as a, a very clean, modern design. And you imagine in 1932, when it was completed, it was um, yeah, completely you know, off the charts, radical. <laughs> um, like the most, one of their taglines um, or what that appeared in the me news media at the time was the most, the oldest is the, is the most modern. So um, even having that approach of like, oh, we're gonna just really jump forward and show this very radical new design. But um, yeah, so the architects are high. George Howe, William Scott, they came together as partners on this project. Um, and George Howe had been, he kind of had this upbringing in conservative Philadelphia society, um, but he was trained in the Beaux-Arts style, which, which is more historical. Um, and William Scott was a Swiss architect who had come to America to kind of realize the modern spirit um, in architecture. Um, it wasn't having a lot of luck. <laughs> and so, so coming together was really the perfect storm for both of them. I think it was the most significant project that either had, had done in their careers. Um, but, um, but yeah, like things like the, the client, uh, James Wilcox, you know, he, if you think of skyscrapers from the late 19th century, early 20th, there's a lot of historical styles where you see Gothic or neoclassical um, sort of vocabulary on those skyscrapers, like um, like the Woolworth building in New York, for example, um, very Gothic style. And that, that's what he said. So he thought his, his skyscraper should look really vertical, but that was actually the opposite of what modern architects did. <laughs> they wanted it to look more horizontal. So there was this back and forth about the client wanting it to look vertical and the architects wanting it, look, wanting it to look horizontal. But what's interesting is that they actually had to kind of make both parties happy. And so um, the, which side is that? The east facade uh, actually is a mix of vertical and horizontal. Um, and then the north facade is horizontal. And then the, um, I think the west side is both horizontal and vertical. So there's this interesting mix. I do think it was a positive, unique outcome. Uh, the, the building's expression is, is known as international style, but that's really more of the architect's view of things. <laughs> Um, it's, it's got a lot of influences. That time was very experimental. Um, There's Art Deco, um, as well as sort of um, Streamline Modern and these kind of um, different expressions. There's still trying to figure out what modern architecture was. So it's, it's a very unique, and, and yeah, with the client's um, concern about it looking um, like, like something of the client. There's also this conversation in the letters between George Howe and um, James Wilcox, where James Wilcox asks Howe, please don't make this building about you. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> please don't make this building about you. It, make it about PSFS, like it's about the company. And you know, so George Howe gives his word that he, he will do that. And, and I think he did in the end. I think you know, they really did have a, a dynamic where the architects listened to the client. Um, they discussed it. Um, there's all these, and I show it in my book, the different studies of the elevations, the vertical versus the horizontal. I think there were seven or eight uh, study, design studies done um, of, of how that could be um, variations on that, that they showed the client. Um, and also the sign, it's the same thing kind of happened with the sign because the client wanted the whole name, Philadelphia Saving Fund Society written out on that sign, which reads PSFS, it's just the initials, and that's what the architects wanted. Um, and they had a back and forth about that as well. So how did they sort of, uh, oh, for lack of a better way to put it, learn to speak each other's languages? That's a really good question. Um, I think, 
you know, I think the architects, um, you know, I think some architects might just like quit. <laughs> I guess there's lots of ways that but the, these things sort of turn out. Like they architects get fired, they quit. <laughs> like there's that kind of extreme version where they can't deal with it. But but I think because how Lascaz drew all these different variations, you know, they listened, they kind of thought, okay, well, how can we uh, integrate these client concerns? And so they showed them new drawings. Um, and with the elevations, you see the, the vertical and the horizontal expressions sort of coming together. And then you actually see them both there. Um, yeah. So I guess, yeah, I don't know if, well, interest, yeah. George Howe definitely, um, uh, George Howe was probably more of the client partner. Like he, he dealt with Wilcox primarily. Uh, Lascaz was mainly in New York, basically running running their office and kind of doing the drawings and design work. And how um, how even had this kind of um, yeah to sort of because the interesting thing about modernism, so modern architecture, just to sort of define it, is um, you know very simple forms, um, but that can be read as also like efficient, and so there was always this language used. And I think the architects did it purposely that, that the modern design was gonna save PSFS money. Um, and there was these ads um, in the archive, there were a lot of these ads from the, at that time called the, the public ledger, the local newspaper um, advertising the office space that was gonna be rented, that it would be, it would save, save you time, uh, money, um, by being really simple and that though not a lot of like I think decorative in to think about that in contrast to sort of the historic historical styles where there's more decorative details um, that you just wouldn't have like those decorative details in modern design but that would save you money um, and since these were offices office tenants um, or business tenants um, that they could be really efficient working in there no frills um, and that would appeal to the to the tenants, potential tenants, and the and the client overall. So I guess a uh, big question then is, did it save them money? Um, I'm trying to <laughs> remember um, at the end of that chapter. Um, I did write something about that. Um, I think the budget did come in a little lower than what they had projected. I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's probably more of a, of a, um, yeah, aesthetic thing because like I know from practice, like let's say you want like a really clean edge. Um, a lot of times adding a piece of material covers the, the sort of um, the, what's it called? Like um, things like not being straight. They add another piece to cover up like, the corner, like where the wall meets the floor, um, which would not be a modern detail. But when you actually leave it exposed, you have to do more to get it straight and, you know, that sort of exposed. So yeah, in some ways the, the modern um, design, like this to sort of generally, I don't think is less expensive. I think it may be more of a, um, an impression. But I do, I do think, well, the whole thing about the PSFS building was that um, they, you know, the, the stock market crashed in 1929, but they kept, and they were in the middle of the design process and they decided to keep going because, you know, the saving fund already had the money to pay for the building. And in fact, the material costs were lower because of the crash. Um, so it, it actually did save them money just to go ahead and and they use some really luxurious and exotic materials on that, in that building. Um, and they were, they were less expensive as a result of the economic crisis. So what, uh, what sort of luxurious and exotic materials did they use? Um, so there's Belgian marble. Um, so that the main in space at the banking hall, which is on the second floor, 
Um, it's this um, very voluminous, uh, multi-leveled space um, really meant to, so it was somewhat unusual that the banking hall would be on the second floor and not right off the street. Um, there, was, there was this um, A&P grocery store actually on the ground floor, but you had to come up um, at either escalator or stairs to get to that second floor banking hall. And the impression was, you know, of luxury when you, when you walked in. Um, there, there was a bank down the street that did have a second floor banking hall as well, but it was still, you know, in the general scheme of things, pretty uh, unique to have a second floor banking hall. So you kind of come up and sort of re remove yourself from the everyday hustle bustle of Market Street, which was basically a shopping um, district at the time. You come up into this voluminous space that was full of materials like Belgian marble in different um, sort of, there was a green and a black marble and also curved forms, that, that marble taking on these curved forms and also a reflective um, finish on that marble. So you get this, this sort of shine off that marble as well, reflectivity and shine off that marble as well. And the, the big hall also had these really large high windows. So you could see the buildings um, across the street and also with the light coming in. Um, yeah, so really creating, and there's this beautiful mezzanine. It's still there, you can see it, this mezzanine level that was also sheathed in marble and curved that came into the space. So it really was a very, um, um, I guess if, I mean, interactive in, in the sense that there were a lot of um, material, different materials and for, the curve, curve forms going on. And then, and then the window with natural light happening in that space. So I guess something that I'm curious about, um, and forgive me if this is a kind of a long, awkward compound question, is uh, how these architects, not just for the example we've been talking about with PSFS, but for every building in your book, sort of translate and sell these ideas to their clients. Because I guess, um, in a way, I am sort of preoccupied with PSFS since that's the oldest. So mm -hmm. I'm imagining in my mind, Wilcox, uh, the sort of age you would expect a person who runs a bank to be in 1932, like this looks nothing like he would have imagined for himself when he was a young man, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So like, w would, were the clients ever, uh, blindsided by the ideas that were presented to them, like just totally like, how do you negotiate that trust when something looks like, pro at least to me as a casual observer on the street, like profoundly decidedly different to what it would have looked like 30 years ago? Um, let me see if I understand your question. Wait, um, you're talking about when, when the Wilcox was an older man, like why is he, commissioning such a, I guess, progressive kind of design that he wouldn't have commissioned 30 years prior? That, well, I'm just trying to imagine uh, how you might navigate with someone who is from an older, more conservative institution and is right. like themselves an older, presumably more conservative person. Right, right. Uh, That's a good question. Well, so um, luckily for George Howe, so George Howe left um, another firm before joining with Lascaz, and that prior fir firm was more conservative. Um, it was Meller, Meigs, and Howe, and they did a lot of like country houses, like for wealthy people. Um, and I think because Howe grew up in like this society, high society of Philadelphia, he could speak uh, Wilcox's language, and Wilcox felt comfortable with him. Um, he, they had a similar upbringing, but how was really fascinated by the new architecture, which was modern design. And he was interested in the Bauhaus and Le Corbusier and these European modernists at the time, even though he was trained in the Beaux-Arts tradition, which is Paul Cray and the neoclassical uh, kind of design. So yeah, George Howe was sort of this bridge between, and he was interested in aligning with William, William Lascaz, he thought, oh, Lascaz is this, he's the real deal, he's this European modernist, I wanna 
partner with him and see where we go. Um, so I, I do think that Wilcox um, had some, it was sort of like he had the trust in how, because he knew him, he was this other Philadelphian man and from the same background. And I guess he was, and then the other part, I think he did kind of allow how to sort of take him somewhere where he was unfamiliar, <laughs> which was the modern design. Um, because I do think it wasn't easy, like, you know, for this modern skyscraper to, to come to fruition, I don't think it would, didn't seem like a very easy thing. Like, like there was, it was a bit of a struggle. Um, but so when Howe was with Miller and Meeks, they, they designed some branch banks for PSFS. And you do see this transition. This was 1924, um, 1926. Um, and one, the first one in 24, Real, is much more neoclassical. And you see the, the neoclassical details like the arched doorway and the, and the, um, the uh, decorative detail around, around the, it, but it was a box. It was a box, but it had these neoclassical details. And then in 26, a lot of that um, decoration falls away and it becomes more of a plain box with just very slight, like more of the Paul Cray. So Paul Philippe Cray was this um, Beaux-Arts trained architect and he did um, like the original Barnes Foundation in Marion and he did the Rodin Museum on the Parkway. It's this very clean neoclassical where you get like, they're boxes. I mean, you still see, you know, a classical spirit but it's much more pared down. Like it does not have as much decoration as you would um, yeah, with earlier. Uh, neoclassical. So yeah, so so we we do see this kind of transition towards uh, a modern, a clean modern design. So it isn't it isn't completely um, out of the blue. I think for Wilcox to have accepted it, he kind of got <laughs> I think he got sort of guided towards the modern design. Right. Oh, I, I'd used a metaphor earlier about. Uh... American brands learning a new language. Uh, might it be reasonable to conclude that Wilcox was maybe something of an enthusiastic student? I think that might be stretching it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, yeah, just, just remembering my impressions from looking at the archival materials. Um, he was a pretty conservative guy. Uh, but I do think when it comes to, you know, like his own house or his own, you know, design, I think, I think he still saw the business as different. Like, I think he knew that being more progressive with the saving fund was the right thing for the business, you know, and he could, you know, separate that from any sort of personal, you know, inclination about design. Because we all have sort of our own personal things we like design wise, right? But I think he did see that. Um, you know, he embraced, uh, you know, having the PSFS go into the future and, and having a modern design he, he realized was the way to, you know, to do that. Keep moving on with it. Yeah. You know, the building was very much a mixed use, you know, really early example of a mixed use building. It was, they only, PSFS only occupied a few floors of that building. Um, the top executive floor where the, where the boardroom uh, boardrooms are and also like in the middle at the mezzanine, um, the banking hall and then a couple floors above that. But that was it. The rest of the skyscraper was all rented rented spaces and also on the ground floor with the shops. And was the that, subway, yeah. Was that a new idea too at the time that you build a skyscraper and if your name's on it, you're also a landlord? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think it was relatively new, but I don't think they were the first to do it. That's actually, yeah, something I should <laughs> do a little further research on. It's a really good question. The naming rights, yeah. And it would seem that the brand is still strong. It stuck around. I mean, they, you know, there's still a PSFS sign today on the yes. building. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that's a whole preservation issue. I mean, luckily um, the Lowe's Hotel 
uh, purchased the building and renovated it for hotels and agreed to keep PSFS on there. Um, I just did a talk recently for Docomomo about how, um, you know, keeping that sign, because these signs like the PSFS and the logo really are so important for the community. Um, you know, in urban, you know, people identify cities with, with things like signs, like the PSFS sign. And by changing it, like let's say if it was changed to Lowe's <laughs> or something, of course mm -hmm. it's the new owner, right? Like technically it's, oh, it should be the owner, but there's something about the collective memory of a city and sort of civic, you know, the civicness that keeping it um, what it was for so many years and the original, it, it's a little bit of this preser historic preservation that you're sort of preserving the client identity, even though the client has changed. And, and you know, we like that as preservationists because it keeps, I mean, a living building is better than well, a demolished building <laughs> mm -hmm. or something that becomes so altered, you know, it loses its historical significance. So, um, yeah, I mean, now the sign is LED and that oh. was a struggle to change that because they, again, with the historic preservation, they wanted to keep it neon, mm -hmm. but it became too costly. You know, there aren't many people who can fix neon lights anymore. It's, it's costly. Um, and the LED is pretty, they look the same really from far away. So it was switched to neon. I mean, I'm sorry, LED a few years ago. So when you approach uh, topics like these, do you view the buildings themselves, if they're still existent, as a primary source document too? I did visit, like the four case studies in this building, I did visit them all. Um, yeah, for, yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting question. I mean, I guess for me as, a, as an architect myself, I, it was important to visit the building. Um, and maybe in some ways, like the experience of the, of the building. And of course, there's always photographs, you know, they, the, not everything is documented um, in the photographs. But um, yeah, it, it was really important to visit each of the buildings. Um, do you have any other uh, examples? I know we've had a very, uh, Philadelphia Saving Fund Society uh, dominated conversation, but do you have any other examples from the book you'd like to shine a light on or maybe some interesting details that uh, didn't make the cut for the book? Oh, yeah, so um, so the case studies in this book, so um, the, the case studies basically represent the different strategies for architectural branding and it's sign, PSFS building, fame, form and material. Um, and fame is the Frank Lloyd Wright Johnson Wax building. Form is Lever Brother, Lever House, which is Lever Brothers. And material is, is um, Roman Haas, which is also in Philadelphia, a chemical company that produces plexiglass. Um, the one that didn't make the cut, <laughs> the one that was in my dissertation, but I switched it for the book was the Reynolds Metals um, sales headquarters um, by Minoru Yamazaki. Um, and the reason why I switched it was that was a regional sales headquarters. It wasn't national. So on one of the peer reviews, like th that was mentioned. So I switched it to Roman Haas, but that, um, that building is really interesting. Um, but in Roman Haas, that case study kind of, uh, achieved some of the things that, um, that Reynolds did, but that was basically like the aluminum. So the architect was asked to, Yamasaki was asked to um, make a show piece out of aluminum. So he creates this glass box and he makes this intricate um, ring, like aluminum ring screen that goes all around the building, almost like a piece of jewelry because it was anodized aluminum in a gold uh, uh, metal. And so it's this really flashy. It's also in the suburbs of Detroit. So it's amongst like um, the big Victor Gruen mall that's out at Southfield, Michigan, um, you know, just sort of like the suburban landscape with this like anodized aluminum box kind of glittering. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, that was a really interesting case study. Um, 
I did get published um, in a journal called Design and Culture, but um, yeah, that was the one that got away from this book. <laughs> Did you have any other interesting archival finds for uh, your case studies that that those didn't make the cut, or did you were you able to fit in everything that you found? Um, for the most part, yeah, I really enjoyed looking at these business archives. I thought it was so rich um, with Roman Haas. So that uh, the Roman Haas company, um, all of their archives are at the what used to be called the Chemical Heritage Foundation, now, now called the Science History Institute. And um, yeah, there was, there was just so much in there about how the company thought about plexiglass and their experiments of trying to market it in all kinds of different, you know, from ta car tail fins to, um, you know, fabric with fashion um, to, and to architecture. There were a lot of interesting architectural experiments with plexiglass. You know, most, you know, some that didn't take and some that took, but, but just a really fascinating, um, yeah, look into how a company tries to um, cast their material as something that the public will really catch on to. And, uh, and of course, the historical moments being really interesting. A lot of that fabric was with like 1960s fashions and <laughs> some really funky things that they're trying to, well, and, you know, yeah, the, the, all of their, their um, acrylic sort of that material is just so incredibly um, versatile and flexible. It's really fascinating. Hmm. Actually, that's a detail that I am now, I now find myself curious about with your case study, since some of these were early adopters of new methods, materials, technology, and are all four still standing? Which one? Are all four of them still standing? Oh, um, yes. 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 Um, so as they've sort of uh, remained part of the built landscape, have there been any uh, large unforeseen issues with maintenance over the decades? Um, these four in particular, um, I mean, probably the biggest, well, it's interesting you say that. I mean, the historic preservation has a big ha, is a big uh, aspect of that. Um, PSFS um, is landmarked. I believe it's a national landmark, but um, but we also know that sometimes even with landmark status, things get demolished. But luckily, they have this. You know, the Lowe's Hotel is a great steward of that building. Roman Haas now um, it, it's also landmarked, but it's. But it's been changing hands a couple times in the recent past, so there is some some worry about that. But maintenance-wise, and then um, Johnson Wax is still owned by you know Johnson Wax still occupies it. So of course mm -hmm. the best scenario is the original owner, um, and Lever House. Um, yeah, you know Lever, you know Unilever, which it is now. Um, they don't occupy that building anymore, but it is landmarked. Um, but Lever House went through a very extensive renovation. I think all the, you know, it's interesting. That building is like these two slabs, like a vertical slab and a horizontal slab. And it was this blue green glass. Um, this is early days of curtain wall construction where it was actually a pretty like homemade kind of curtain wall, even though it's very, you know, much a glass box when they were designing it, it was not, they were like now, you know, these days, these are all you buy, it looks, it's like a kit of parts, right? It's all it's this kind of machine made building. But when Lever House was built in the, in the late forties, it wasn't like that at all. They had to basically figure it out. And it was almost like, you know, building a wood shack, but it happened to be out of glass. So it had to be completely re, um, re um, sheathed as a glass box a, a, a few years ago, maybe more than a few years ago. It looks good now, but I, if it were still the original uh, glass, I, it, would, it wouldn't look that great today. Um, but luckily, you know, it, it was, um, it's by this firm Skidmore, Owens, Owens and Merrill, and, it, and luckily they, um, you know, it was significant enough to, to merit and you know, had funding to, to sort of re, 
redesign and reconstruct that that curtain wall. That's good. Sometimes being one of the first folks to accomplish something can come with its own risks, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, but also exciting, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I see that we're starting to draw close to our time today. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you really wish I would have? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention, you know, I think, um, like from the architectural standpoint, like corporate modernism, which these buildings essentially are corporate modernism, kind of gets a bad reputation because they, um, like if you think of like the more like into the 60s, you get a lot of these mirror facades and, or even just these kind of volume, these boxes that, you know, the general public, I guess it was always accused of not communicating well with the general public, that they were these kind of closed boxes that weren't interested in like engaging people. But yeah, I guess my hope with the book is showing that how, um, if the, these buildings being about branding, we're all about connecting with the consumers, connecting with the public, um, and sort of showing this, these buildings in a new light um, and how they do connect with, with people um, because of that branding aspect. Are there any other takeaways you'd like readers to have? Um, yeah, thinking about the architectural um, sort of architectural, because you know we think about branding as a two-dimensional phenomenon, right? It's like graphics, logo, you know, stuff. Even you know, like with a website, it's very flat. Um, but thinking about um, branding as architectural, you know, next time you go into some sort of public space and or maybe even like a yeah like a some sort of office building um you know realizing how much um experience and spatial effects um really kind of come back to the the user the inhabitant and how architecture sort of gives um, is very impactful um as a communicator so i think that's a great takeaway so i'll certainly uh, look back at some of my favorite parts of the book again with that in mind. Uh, well, um, before I start to close this out, then, do you have any final thoughts? Um, I, I appreciate your time, and this was fun. All right. And thank you again for sitting down with us. And that's another episode of Hagley History Hangout. Uh, if you liked what you heard today, you can subscribe to us on YouTube or find us on SoundCloud. Thanks.